stuff that we've been doing in my lab. Um, I've got a lot of content. I'm going to do my best to get through 30 minutes for you here and not, and not keep you too terribly long. Um, I've got to hop on the road uh, to fly out to another meeting at 5 o'clock. Um, so I'm leaving right after my presentation. But I want to introduce two people who are not going to be leaving, um, Katie Svoboda. Um, she's a graduate student in my lab, and a lot of the information you're going to be seeing has been generated by her. So she's one of the people doing all the hard work that I get to stand up and talk about. The other person is Jesse Carden. Jesse is a postdoc in the lab. They're both working on Spotted Wing Drosophila, and so you'll see data that both of them have generated. Um, they're going to stick around uh, partially because we've got um, an expansion of a project that we'll be bringing into Blackberries this year, and we're actively seeking locations that we can do that research at. So they'll be here to hopefully touch bases with some folks who might be willing to have us do some on-farm research related to our projects. All right, so I'm going to go over uh, some general impacts of Spotted Wing Drosophila in 2013. I'm going to talk about what we have learned about this bug in the last year, and then uh, briefly go over some management recommendations. All right, so in 2013, in North Carolina at least, we've had generally, back off this a little, we've had limited impacts in strawberries, um, although where we have seen infestation, it's typically been in day neutral fruit. Um, so we have seen some infestation, it showed up later in the season. If I grow strawberries in the spring, I'm treated by a wood. I can find markings. Whether or not that's the case at grower locations, we don't know because we haven't gotten any complaints. Blackberries and I'm intimately familiar with this bug now. Uh, for blueberries in 2013, any damage that we have essentially developed in our processing season. So late harvest, rapid eye for the most part, um, less during the, the commercial uh, fresh market season. And then in grapes, we have not had any reports of spotted wing drosophila infestation in grapes. We actually did some uh, laboratory screening of some fresh market grapes that are grown here in North Carolina, and we did not see any egg laying in those either. So, so grapes are not something we've had a whole lot of an issue with this, with respect to this bug here in North Carolina, at least. That's not necessarily the case everywhere. Um, one of the goals uh, of a of a number of different programs, and in particular of a working group that I'm involved in, is to assess the impact of this particular bug. Um, the reason why it's important that we assess the impact of spotted wing drosophila is for us to understand if we're doing the right kind of work, so we know what types of impacts you all are experiencing, but more importantly, this is an insect that um, has really changed how we manage our berry crop. And in order to get management tools that are more appropriate, so in other words, new insecticides, for example, we need to have evidence that we have significant impact in different types of categories. So it's one of the reasons that we've been assessing impact for this critter. We did a preliminary survey online in December and January, and one of the key impacts that we noticed was 60% of our respondents had a dramatic increase in management efforts associated with spotted wing drosophila. That's a fancy way of saying we are applying more insecticides um, that was a preliminary online survey, but what we really need your help with is we have a hard copy survey here, and if you guys wouldn't mind passing those around, um, we would like to get your feedback on some of the impacts that you've directly experienced due to spotted wing drosophila. So it's a short two-page survey. If you could fill that out at some point today and give it to either Jesse or Katie before you leave, um, that would be extremely helpful. What we're asking about are things like increases in management practices, increases in labor costs, anything that we can directly tie to spotted wing drosophila. How we're going to use this information is, first and foremost, we're going to use it in support of newer insecticide registrations or expansions of labels that might already exist. We phrase the questions in order to be useful in that context. We're also going to be using this information to plan research that we're doing, and then finally we're going to be using this information to justify requests for support for research. So we're going to use this information to hopefully generate grant funds in order to work on this insect to a greater extent. Um, so that's really important info for us, um, and we want to make sure we get as realistic and as comprehensive data as possible. Um, so if you've already filled out this survey at another meeting, I've been passing it out at every meeting I've been going to, there's no need to fill it out again. 
Um, and if you filled it out online, there's also no reason to duplicate it. Um, but if you haven't filled it out already, if you haven't seen it before, please do complete it. And we've got additional copies of your guys if you run out. Um, we're going to be sharing the results of this survey at the end of February when we've had a chance to compile everything at this website. This is our working group website. This is the working group that compiles these impact statements. So it's just swd.ces.ncsu.edu. All right, um, so let's move on to some of the things that we know about spotted wager sofa. We know that they really like to eat the crops that the folks in this room grow. So this is work that we did uh, giving them either a choice or no choice of blackberries, blueberries, raspberries, and strawberries, and they lay more eggs in, in raspberries than they do with any of these other fruits. Um, they like blackberries a whole lot too, um, but even more so, they will actually develop quicker in raspberries than those other fruits, um, perhaps because they're softer, and more of those larvae will survive in raspberries than they will in other fruits. So we'll actually get higher survivorship. We have a shorter development time, and we have better survivorship coming out of that fruit. So we can actually generate more of them in that highly susceptible raspberry crop. Um, we've also learned in the past that firmness really plays a role in the type of fruit that Spotted Winter Sockle are selecting. Um, so based on this work that suggested that the really soft fruit, so this low penetration force here for raspberries, were really heavily infested, we created some artificial media that had differences in penetration force. And so we made this grape media, and we either gave them no choice, or we gave them a choice between all the different firmnesses of that media. And when that firmness <coughs> exceeded a certain point, we saw no eggs being laid. So there is a point at which fruit is too hard for those flies to be interested in laying eggs in, potentially. And we see that in the lab and we've seen that to a certain extent out in the field. Um, we've also, in previous work, demonstrated that there's variability in infestation rates between our blackberries and raspberry varieties. So these are our blackberries here in purple, these are our raspberries here in red, and this is the number of Drosophila larvae per berry. And you can see there's a lot of range between the number of larvae per berry we're finding between varieties of blackberries and varieties of raspberries. We did similar work in blueberries in 2012 and 2013, and in strawberries, day neutral strawberries in 2013, and we haven't seen this same pattern develop for any of those other fruits. Um, we haven't collected quite as much data, so I'm not entirely sure if that's real, but we do see some variability. And I think the interesting thing going on here, for me in particular, is that if you look down on this end of our lower infested blackberry varieties, there's some of our primocane fruiters. And our largest spotted wing drosophila populations are typically in the fall or later in the summer. And we're still seeing a relatively low infestation in some of our prime cane fruiting varieties, which are fruiting more toward that period when we would expect to have high spotted wing drosophila populations. So that's one of the reasons it makes us think this is variety related and not just uh, something to do with seasonal activity patterns, for example. And we've done similar things in the lab and we see similar responses in the lab. All right. So that's some of the historic stuff that we knew going into 2013. These are the key points um, that a group of us who work on this critter kind of coalesced that we've learned in the last year. And I've used these to structure the talks that I've been giving about this bug um, to kind of walk you through the different information that we've learned. Um, so first of all, we learned that we generally have enough insecticides or materials to construct a rotation program that will last us through the entire growing season. That was a concern we had at the beginning for this bug, are we gonna run out of sprays? That seems to not be the case. If we are thoughtful about how we design our programs, we can make it through the season. Um, in some work we did with blueberries that I'm gonna show you because it has application in blackberries and because we're expanding it to blackberries, um, we didn't exceed our pesticide maximum residue levels using that rotational program. Um, bear in mind, this is a really rainy year. The residual activity for the materials that we observed in that experiment was no more than seven days. So our seven-day rotation program is probably where we need to be right now in terms of frequency of insecticide applications. Um, we did some work on baits and lures that you can put in traps for pup spotted winter sofa, and we found that many things will catch flies at least one to two weeks earlier 
than our apple cider vinegar, which we had been using in the past. So we have some better things that you could potentially put in traps. Um, we concluded as a group that fruit sampling is very important, and I'll show you some data as to why that is. Um, we've learned that larvae do not develop, continue to develop, at typical post-harvest storage temperatures. However, they don't necessarily die in those temperatures. So they're not going to get you bigger, but they're not necessarily going to go away. And I'll show you some data to support that. Um, we've identified some new insecticides that are effective against Spotted Drosophila, some improvements to existing insecticides, um, particularly adding sugar to some, some insecticides and seeing a potential improvement. Um, we've learned that pesticide coverage remains important. Um, we need to do more work on some of these other means of improving pesticides. And for me, the bottom line for this bug still boils down to, we're about protecting fruit. We're not necessarily about killing flies. And we'll talk about that in our management program. So I'm going to focus on this stuff. Um, I am happy to answer questions about these points. Um, that was work that was done by colleagues in other states. So I'm familiar with it. But I'm going to show you mostly stuff that we've generated this year. All right, so let's first start about talk about our rotational programs. So this is work that we did in blueberries, and the focus here was to test at a grower-relevant scale different types of rotational insecticide programs to manage spotted wing drosophila. Much of the work that had been done before this year for insecticide management was looking at a single active ingredient and the efficacy of that active ingredient not those active ingredients in combination as we would recommend them over the course of a field season. So what we did was we had weekly rotations between different materials in each of these three treatments, and these materials were selected in different categories. So in this case, these were all materials that were acceptable to our major trading partners. These were materials that had the shortest pre-harvest interval. These are materials that were a reduced risk Category, so they are softer on some of our beneficial insects, narrow <coughs> spectrum materials, and then we compared those to an untreated control. This is what one of our sites looked like. This is about 13 acres, um, so each, actually this site was about 8 acres. Um, so this, each of these plots ended up being about a, a fourth, or sorry, four tenths of an acre. Um, so seven row plots and fairly deep. And we applied all of our material with grower scale equipment. We used the same equipment that the grower was potentially using in that field. Um, we made all the applications. We made them on a weekly basis. We rated infestation. And as I mentioned, we didn't really have infestation develop in our, in our southern highbush blueberries this year. So we also conducted laboratory bioassays to measure the efficacy of these materials since our infestation was very low in the field. One of the biggest take-home messages that we had out of this experiment was over the course of the season, our maximum observed residue levels at no point exceeded the MRLs for our key trading partners. Um, so the lines across these graphs are the MRLs for Japan, Canada, and US when those countries have a residue level for those materials. And at no point did we exceed them. We did get close with our maximums for some of these. And I'm going to talk about this material a little bit more. Um, but we have, that gave us a little bit of a, a, a bit of confidence that we weren't exacerbating some problems by putting more insecticide out there. We weren't exceeding MRLs. Um, but I do want to talk about zeta cypromethrin a little bit. This is the active ingredient in Mustang Max. This is an active ingredient that is widely used in blackberries and raspberries to manage spotted wing drosophila because it has a one-day PHI, and it's effective. This is a material that does not have a tolerance with one of our important trading partners, Canada. And there were some questions about whether or not this is a material that was readily detectable following application. And so what we've done is just at our two North Carolina sites here, broken out application date in the red arrows, and then average zeta cypromethrin residues on sampling dates after those application dates. Then the max residues are the black points, the min residues are the open gray points. And the take home message that I'd like to make here is that we don't zero out those zeta cypromethrin residues. We don't get down to zero. They don't become non-detectable. 
So if you are marketing your fruit for export, and one of your destinations is Canada, I would carefully consider whether or not this material should be in your rotational program. Because as of now, at least based on what we've seen in blueberries, in a particularly wet year where we would expect to have relatively low residues because it rained like crazy, um, we still didn't zero out what we were seeing. Even, you know, relatively late after an application. So that's a concern that bear in mind when you're selecting your materials. Uh, this is the bioassay data. As I mentioned, our field infestation data were not great. This is our untreated control, and this is the degree of mortality in those different types of treatments. We have high mortality across the board. All of the treatments were effective. We did have a little variability in this reduced risk treatment on dates when we used a material called a sale uh, as one of our alternatives. That was a material that did not perform as well in terms of adult mortality. When we did these same bioassays seven days after the materials were applied, we had essentially no mortality. So we did not see any greater than a seven day residual activity. We saw less than seven days activity out of all of those materials. So a seven day spray interval is really what we'd encourage folks to use at this point, based on the fact that we don't see anything going beyond that. In 2014, we are expanding this work to blackberries. So we intend to do the same thing. We intend to design rotational programs that are relevant to grower needs in blackberries. And this is where I am asking all of you guys in this room to think about considering cooperating with us. We're looking to identify at least one location where we can implement a grower scale size plot. We would like something between a quarter of an acre and a half acre plot size. So we're talking about a relatively large area. We will make all the insecticide applications, or if you are more comfortable making your own insecticide applications, we will work with you to get those on. Um, in blueberries, we included an untreated control. We do not intend to do that in blackberries because we know how risky that is for you guys. So we're gonna use all rotational programs and compare them to each other in this system. And our intention in the blueberries was as soon as we had any concern about infestation in those untreated controls, we would pull the trigger to treat them. But in our harvest period, that didn't happen. But for you guys, we, we know what the risk is if we don't treat. So we're not intending on including a grower or an untreated control on our grower sites. Um, if that's something you're interested in learning more about, please talk to Jesse before he leaves today. Um, we're, we'd like to get these plots out um, toward the middle of May, if possible, so we get them established before we get fruit out there. Um, so we'd be happy to talk about that more, and we, may, we try to make it as easy as possible for you guys to, to cooperate with this work. Um, and it's something that's it's really, it's giving us a lot of really good info. All right, so let's move on to talk about baits and lures. You guys have heard a lot of talk about traps for Sun and Winter Sofla, and you've heard a lot of information about ways you can trap flies and not a whole lot of information about how valuable those traps are because right now those traps have uh, essentially one function which is presence or absence detection. Um, the traps that we use are traps that have a relatively large volatilization area, a large surface area of our lure because previous work that was coordinated by a colleague of mine in Oregon demonstrated that if you have a larger surface area, catch more flies. And we use traps that have holes on the side because that same experiment demonstrated that holes on the side were better than holes on the top. Um, so flies like to go like this, they don't like to go like that. And so these are the traps that we used in this experiment. And what this experiment was testing was six different bait or lure combinations across 10 different states in a range of different crops. And so what these different combinations were designed to do were mimic what we thought people were already using and some tweaks that some scientists had come up with. These experiments ran for eight weeks and they were done while crops were actively fruiting. The treatments were apple cider vinegar. This has kind of been our standard. Lots of folks have used it over a long time. This is our other standard. 
which is a yeast and sugar mixture. It's a slurry of yeast and sugar in water. This, uh, we call it our fermenting bait treatment. It's essentially a watery bread dough mixture floating in a solution of apple cider vinegar and a little bit of ethanol. Um, it's pretty cumbersome to work with, but it was developed by some folks in Connecticut and Vermont. Um, they've been using something similar. So it kind of combines the odors from here, the odors from here, and tries to exclude the really gross stuff from what would be the drowning solution for the bug. This treatment uh, was developed in Europe. It's a wine-containing treatment that they call it the Drosky drink. So it's wine, sugar, and ethanol, or an apple cider vinegar. And then we had two synthetic lures. Um, these synthetic lures were the same in each of these treatments, and we either hung them over apple cider vinegar or we hung them over an unscented solution. And so these are an under, -develop under commercial development by a company. They wanted to get some information. We wanted to get some information as to whether or not these synthetic lures would be as good as some of our homemade baits. So this is combining all of the data from all the locations and all the crops. Our synthetic lure over apple cider vinegar and our fermenting bait caught the most flies. That's the key take home message from here. We did have some difference between our blueberry sites and our blackberry and raspberry sites. So our blueberry sites caught relatively low fly numbers and we didn't have a whole lot of differences between some of these treatments. In our blackberry and raspberry sites though, that fermenting cup caught way more flies, although our synthetic lure, our yeast, and our drosky drink were similar to each other. So we did have some higher top captures than apple cider vinegar. Regardless of what crop you're talking about, apple cider vinegar performed poorly. Um, we also had differences between males and females. Um, where we caught more females, we tended to catch more of them in that fermenting bait, although not significantly different than our synthetic lure. And males were the same between that fermenting bait and synthetic lure. And I'm not going to parse out all of these differences, but I did want to show that we catch more females than males in our blackberry and raspberry sites. We catch more males than females in our blueberry sites. However, we can catch more flies, but none of these traps remain selective for spotted wind or soft. So we're still catching, this is the proportion of the total spotted wing, of the total Drosophila species, all the little brown flies in that trap that were spotted wing Drosophila. So we're still catching less than 50% of the total flies being spotted wing Drosophila. And where we're catching a higher percentage of flies as SWD, those are not the traps that catch a lot of flies to begin with. So lousy traps catch a lot of SWD. Um, but they're not catching a whole lot of flies to begin with. Our really attractive traps to spotted wind drosophila are also really attractive to lots of other things. They catch a low total proportion of spotted wind drosophila. The good news from this experiment is that everything that we compared to apple cider vinegar caught flies between one and two weeks earlier than apple cider vinegar did. So this is particularly encouraging for the very first fruit that you have come in. So just to summarize this, those fermenting baits and synthetic lures were similar in total trap captures when we stuck everything together and averaged it across all sites. The fermenting cup is extremely cumbersome to use. It's not something that would be feasible or practical for a grower to use, but we do hope that some of these synthetic lures will be, labeled, will be available commercially within the next year. So we are moving towards some of those being available, and they are much easier to use than these, these homemade concoctions that you mix up and start fermenting and smelling funky. There is differences in sex attraction between crops, and that may have impacted some of the differences between the baits in these different crops. However, if you catch a lot of flies, you're also going to catch a lot of non-targets. So you're going to catch things other than SWD. And so you need to be prepared to identify what's in that trap if you're trapping. But everything we tested, from yeast through the synthetic lures, caught flies earlier than apple cider vinegar. And that's what we really care about, is knowing when these flies are active in our plantings. So I would discourage folks, if you're interested in trapping, from using apple cider vinegar and consider one of these alternatives, and we'll catch something earlier. 
And if you're going to be trapping, as I said, be sure you are able to identify what's in that trap because they catch a lot of little brown flies. So this is your male, spots on the wings, bands on the front legs. Um, and I like some of the little funky things you can do to make your own magnification tools. You can buy all sorts of really cool things that you can attach to your smartphone, for example, and basically turn it into a microscope. Um, this is a website that put together basically making a desktop microscope out of your smartphone. So it doesn't have to be cumbersome to get some magnification in there. You can buy really nice lenses you can stick on your phone and get really nice magnification. This is your diagnostic characteristic for your female, and this is where you really do need magnification because this egg laying device that's going to be on her rear end is going to be a little hard to see with the naked eye. You're not going to be able to tell with the naked eye that this is what's there. Um, it is larger than the native species you're going to find, and once you've got the right search image, it's not that hard to tell apart, but you do need some enhanced magnification. It's really hard to do with a hand lens. All right. so. While no bait and trap combination to date has been demonstrated to catch flies consistently before infestation occurs, some of these things are promising. Um, so traps still indicate presence or absence for us. That's the information we're getting from them. And when you have SWD potentially active in your area, you should be preventatively managing that. Um, we do think that fruit monitoring needs to be a component of any monitoring program, though. Um, this is our recommended grower scale fruit monitoring strategy. It's just called a salt test. You dissolve a quarter cup of salt in a gallon of water, pour it over a thin layer of fruit on a dark surface, and watch to see if any larvae come out. I'm going to show you a quick video. So these are some raspberries that I poured salt water over, and this is one of the larvae that came out. This is another larva that came out. They will move, so they're not, they're not that hard to see once they're out of the fruit. You want to wait for about 10 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes, before you take a look at it. If you don't see anything, um, if you don't see anything after 10 or 15 minutes, I then crush the fruit. I don't crush it to begin with because there's lots of little fibers that can be hard to tell apart from Drosophila larvae if you crush it right at the beginning. So typically if the damage is there, you'll see it. Um, I'm going to just show you this slide, which is distinguishing between the things you might find in your fruit, such as spotted Drosophila larvae, which are pointed on both ends and don't have any legs, and things like sap beetles, which have distinct heads and legs, and occasionally things like raspberry fruit worm, not much of a problem down here, um, but also have distinct heads and legs. If it has legs, it's not spotted wing drosophila. If it doesn't have legs and it's pointed on both ends, it's potentially spotted wing drosophila. You greatly decrease your risk of having other insects in your sample if what you sample is sound, marketable appearing <coughs> fruit. If your fruit is starting to turn, it's it's likely to have other bugs in it. And it's also likely to have native Drosophila in it, which we cannot tell apart by species. All right. This is some data that Katie generated, and I put it in here to really hit home why it's so important to sample fruit. Um, so one of the things that Katie's interested in for her research is looking at the effects of different types of non-crop habitat on spotted wing drosophila <coughs> populations and infestation. And what she did was establish transects of traps going in from, in this case, a wooded area. So these first traps are in the wooded area and then moving inward into the field. At each of these spots along the grid was a trap and then weekly <coughs> fruit samples were collected. Those fruit samples were assessed for infestation and determined whether or not what the rate of infestation was. So the traps were checked weekly, fruit samples collected weekly, did visit two locations with multiple transects at each location. Um, so starting at the beginning of July when fruit were first available to be collected, there was no infestation present. The second week, there were a couple larvae showing up at a handful of the points on the transect. By the third week, every single point had infestation present. So infestation for this organism can develop extremely rapidly. And 
So, and then in the last sample, there was some infestation remaining, but we were tailing down harvest in that location. And that infestation is not necessarily related to those traps. So th these are the trap captures in those traps, and it's showing you this transect here. So 201 is outside the crop, everything else is moving into the crop up to 209. Highest trap captures are outside the crop. Very low trap captures in the traps in the crop. So your trap captures are not necessarily telling you where the infestation is developing. And in order to know if you have infestation present, you need to be looking at your fruit. And you need to be looking at your fruit on a weekly basis because infestation can develop rapidly. We also had some questions about the timing of infestation. So this is work that Katie did up at the Upper Mountain Research Station where she caged fruit at different ripeness stages. These were the stages she caged in blackberries and these are the stages she caged in raspberries. Um, and we excluded egg laying after the point that it was caged. This is a place with a very high population of flies. And so we assumed that these were all accessible to flies before they were caged. And then after this cage was placed, that they were excluded from infestation. So any larvae developing that fruit were laid prior to any subsequent ripening, at or before the ripeness stage they were caged at. Then those fruit were removed uh, when they were ripe. They were allowed to ripen naturally on the plant, removed when ripe, and held until any larvae emerge. And this is what we saw. So in blackberries, larvae came out of each of those stages. More of them came out of the perfectly ripe fruit, but some of them came out even when they were just changing from green to pink. In raspberries, the same thing. Even when they were changing from green to pink, there were some larvae that managed to survive in that fruit. So what this means is your management action should start when the fruit starts to change color, and your fruit sampling should continue on a weekly basis to assess what the damage in that fruit is potentially at. All right, I'm going to go through this post-harvest stuff, Josh, and then I'll be done. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, so we've also uh, assessed the effect of cold temperatures on larval development. Um, we did this in artificial diet and we did this in fruit. I'm not going to belabor the point for the artificial diet, I'm just going to show you the fruit data. What we did is we infested either blueberries or raspberries because the larvae are developed a little differently in both of those. And we held them either at 35 degrees Fahrenheit or at our control temperature 68 degrees Fahrenheit. We held them for three days at this low temperature, and then we removed them to our high temperature and allowed the larvae to develop. We selected this temperature based on the slides that I skipped by, and we selected this duration based on those slides that I skipped by. We didn't see a whole lot of impact of shorter handling times, and we didn't see as much impact of warmer temperatures. So this is in raspberries, and this is our cold temperature, the number of eggs surviving to pupae, the number of first instars when they were exposed to cold temperatures, middle-aged larvae, and nearly mature larvae when they were exposed to cold temperatures. And we had a significant impact on survival when eggs were held at cold temperature, when our middle-aged larvae were, and when our nearly mature larvae were. Similar to adults in raspberries, again, a significant impact of survivorship to adults when eggs were held and when our middle-aged larvae were, but that effect went away for our newly hatched larvae and our nearly mature larvae. I want to point out one key thing. We don't hit zero here. Nothing dies completely at any of these life stages when held at that temperature. This is for blueberries, and in blueberries we did actually have complete mortality when eggs were exposed to 35 degrees for three days, and we had a significant reduction in mortality when our nearly mature larvae were exposed. Same thing for survival to adults. Because we didn't have any of them make it to pupae, we also didn't have any of them make it to adults, and we had that same impact on our nearly mature larvae. In both cases, in both fruit, we saw an increase in development time when blueberries were held at 35 Fahrenheit, or when raspberries were held at 35 Fahrenheit compared to our standard rearing temperature. And the difference between the time required for an egg to make it to an adult was three days 
between this bar and this bar, and this bar and this bar. So essentially, the time we held them at cold temperatures was added to their total lifespan. So what that means is that we're not seeing development occur at those low temperatures. They're not getting any bigger, but they don't necessarily all die. Some of them die, and more of them will die if they're eggs than any other life stage but they don't all necessarily die. Even in blueberries, we exposed 433 eggs at that low temperature for three days, and none of them survived. Um, but for this to be a treatment that would actually be acceptable as a management strategy for you know, shipping your fruit, for example, we'd have to expose a lot more eggs to be able to tell you that's a real zero. So it's, it's a zero in our data, but it's not enough data to be super confident in that zero. So they're not gonna get any bigger in the cold room which is good if they're really tiny. They're not necessarily gonna die. All right. Um, we've talked a lot about insecticide efficacy over the last couple of years. The only point I wanna make here is Exoril, which is a material that, based on uh, cooperative extension specialist surveys throughout the country, is pretty effective against spotted wing, has just been registered in blueberries. We would like to get it registered in blackberries. It's on a timeline to be registered in the next 12 to 18 months. Um, one of the things we're going to do with that impact survey that we sent around is hopefully justify getting some possible emergency exemption for that material. All right. And then just to throw this up here, these are our management recommendations for blackberries for 2014. <coughs> Plan to have good sanitation in your field. This is important. Um, this implies both removing damaged fruit whenever feasible but also thorough harvest. Um, I had a lot of comments at meetings I've been to this year where people say hard to pick varieties or dense canopies have bigger problems with spotted wing drosophila. Thorny varieties might have bigger problems with spotted wing drosophila. And that's partially due to the fact that they're not being picked as thoroughly each time. They're not as easy to pick as thoroughly each time. And what's happening is if you clean every ripe berry off of there every time you pick. Then all the fruit that you're picking into a clamshell is the same age, and it's all had the same exposure time to spotted wing drosophila. If you get berries in a clamshell that have been ripe for five days, berries in a clamshell that have been ripe for one day, that five-day berry has had four more days to be exposed to spotted wing drosophila laying eggs. So the risk of that berry being infested just based on exposure time is greater. So you can reduce or at least make uniform the risk of infestation in your clamshells by having as thorough harvest as possible, not having non-uniform berries go in. Um, begin your management when your fruit is susceptible. When it starts to change color is when it's susceptible. Sample your fruit at each harvest. If you're interested in adult monitoring, use a trap or a bait that is likely to attract flies earlier than apple cider vinegar. But for blackberries and raspberries, we know the flies are there for the most part. So for monitoring, you're going to get some information, but to make your management decision, you're going to want to pull the trigger when the fruit's right. And then finally, rotate between effective materials. These are effective materials listed. The top three are the ones that make the most sense in terms of harvest management. That's it for me, and I'm sorry, I went a little long, Josh. I figure since I can't be here this afternoon, I have. We can go with time for one question for Hannah. If anyone who does have some questions before I leave, I can pop out in the hallway and answer them as well. And you can pass surveys to the back and we can collect those after.